Okay, guys, in the interest of time, I'm going to get going. This has made me very clearly realize that very few Oxford professors are five foot three. <laughs> I feel like I can barely see over the top of this. Um, but hello, welcome back. Um, and yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, David Thorstad. David is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Global Priorities Institute and a junior research fellow at Kellogg College, Oxford. His research sits at the intersection between bounded rationality, inquiry, and global priorities research. He wants to know how bounded agents should make up their minds about what to do and believe, and how the answers to these questions can help us to do good better. Um, if you have questions throughout uh, the talk, please submit them via the Swap Card app, and we'll have five minutes of Q&A after the talk. Um, so please uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to David. All right, so this is a talk today about existential risk. Many of you know existential risks are risks of existential catastrophe, and what is that? One of two things, it could either be extinction, or it could be permanent stagnation, the destruction permanently of our potential for future desirable development. So extinction risk might be um, coming from AI or coming from engineered pandemics, but we could also be worried about stagnation, for example, destroying our capacity to become a spacefaring species. So there are two things we often say about X risk, and we often not only say these things, but think that one supports the other. So the first is what I'm calling the astronomical value claim that mitigating existential risks is not only important, of course it's important, but astronomically important. Sketch argument for that, well, there's an astronomical amount of value in the future. A small risk of not achieving that value is such that if you multiply it through, you've still got astronomical value to reducing that risk. So far, so good. The second thing we do is we're often quite pessimistic about levels of existential risk. So I guess most famously, Toby Ord ballparks X risk in this century, um, namely by 2100 at one in six, or as he puts it, Russian roulette. The royal astronomer Martin Rees is even more pessimistic still. He puts it at a coin flip 50-50 that civilization is going to collapse by 2100. And one of the first conferences we had here at Oxford on existential risk, just looking at the extinction subset of that, of that and taking the median so you don't have outliers driving things up, we get a median, it was 18 or 19% chance of extinction by 2100. So claims in this talk, number one, you might think that being pessimistic about existential risk makes it more, not less important to reduce existential risk. After all, you should usually do more to reduce large risk than small risk. Claim of this talk is, number one, that that's not true, that the more pessimistic you are about levels of per century risk, the less valuable you should think it is to reduce existential risk. Of course, that doesn't mean you can't be both pessimistic about risk and also have an astronomical value to reducing it. So talk, claim two of the talk is what's the best way to get both together, and this is going to be the time of perils hypothesis. So roughly, now is a very dangerous time. It's risky now, risky next century, but pretty soon going to permanently drop to a lower level of risk. So then question three off stage today is should we believe the time of perils hypothesis? You can read the full paper on um, the Global Priorities Institute website if you'd like to read that. And also if you went to um, Hayden Wilkinson's talk, you might have heard about some of our other research. So um, see the full paper for an argument. I think maybe you should not believe the time of perils hypothesis. All right, credit where credit's due. So um, I'm using a class of models here that was kicked off by Toby Ord in 2013, 2014. You'll see a little bit in the appendix to his book. Um, Tom Adamshevsky also did some work on these models, and so I'm just following along a little bit in some models that already got started without me, but I hope I can add a little bit to the discussion. So to see what the problem might be, let's just start with a very simple model. Um, all models are false, but this is maybe more false than other models. So let's just start with a simple model of what's going on and then see what we would have to do to make the situation better for the pessimist. So first, let's assume that ex uh, each century of human existence has constant value. If this century is worth V, next century is worth V, as long as we get there, V, 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 and so on. And second, let's assume that levels of existential risk are constant. If it's risk 20%, call it R this century, then it's 20% equals R next century, 20%, 20%, and so on until a catastrophe. 
And finally, let's assume that we're only interested in extinction risk. That way we can ignore the possibility of value being realized after an existential catastrophe because there's going to be no one around to accrue the value. So okay, these are simplifying assumptions. The rest of the talk is going to be um, what happens if we remove the assumptions. But if we have these assumptions in place, the value of the world today is pretty easy to model. What's the world worth today? Well, this century's worth V. And we're going to get that with probability 1 minus R unless there's a catastrophe. The next century is worth another V. We'll get that with that probability 1 minus R squared. If we make it two centuries, get the next V with probability 1 minus R cubed, and so on and so forth. Push it through its uh, geometric series. You know how to sum that. But we don't really care about the value of the world. We care about what this valuation would say about the importance of reducing existential risk. So I'm going to look at relative risk reduction. If you care about absolute risk reduction or different types of risk reduction, read the paper or trust me, it's not going to help that much. So relative risk reduction asks, what if I took some fraction f, like 20% or 30%, and just chopped risk off by that fraction? And so far in the paper, I'm going to assume that you can only act on risk in this century. So the question would be, what if I took some fixed fraction f off of the risks in this century, and then people in future centuries can deal with risk in their century? So rather surprising conclusion that got people interested in these models is on this model, the value of reducing risk in your own century by fraction f is f, of course, the fraction by which you reduced it, times v, the value of a century of existence. Why would this be surprising? So surprise one, the level of existential risk r that you started with does not show up in this equation. So you might have thought being more or less pessimistic about existential risk would impact how important you think it is to reduce risk. And it turns out on this model, there's no influence of pessimism or optimism on the importance of reducing risk. That's actually going to be a best case for the pessimist throughout the paper. Surprise two is we're not going to get an astronomical value for risk reduction on this model, right? The value of risk reduction is capped at v, the value of a century of existence. Very important. There's a lot of value there, but it's not astronomical in the way that many people have wanted it to be. The question going forward is, okay, I told you these modeling assumptions are false. What happens if we remove these modeling assumptions? How can we make things get better on a pessimistic view of existential risk? So the first thing you might try is, look, I said every century is worth just as much, V and then V and then V, but surely that's not true. There might be more people in the future. They might live longer and healthier and happier and more fulfilling lives. So surely more centuries are going to increase in value relative to the present century. Okay, so let's grant that, and let's just look at ways we could model the increasing value of the future. So, of course, a simple model, you've got no value growth. Every century is worth V and then V and then V. You might model, and this is as far as the, um, the Toby Ord paper goes, you might model linear growth in value so that the i-th century from now is worth i times as much as this century, 10 centuries is 10 times as good, the 100,000th century from now is 1,000 times as good. And just to be, I think, even more generous than Toby was to himself, let's consider quadratic growth in value. So imagine that the i century from now is worth i squared as much, 10 centuries now, 100 times as much, 1,000 times, 1,000 centuries from now, 1,000 squared a million times as much. So obviously this is going to increase the importance of mitigating existential risk, but the question is if you're a pessimist about where we're starting, how much of an increase is it going to give you? And the answer is surprisingly little. So of course, on the simple model, the value of cutting risk by fraction f is just f times the value of a century of human existence. If you've got linear value growth, you're getting a little better. You're dividing out by the starting level of risk r. So if risk was at 20% to start with, you've kicked up by a factor of 5. And quadratic growth, ignore that 2 minus r thing. That's you know, between 1 and 2. That's not going to change qualitatively the behavior you're dividing through by r squared. So if you started at 20% risk, you've kicked up your valuation by a factor of 25. But of course, here you start to see the problem. Dividing by r squared might help if you're an optimist, if you think r is really low. But if you think r is really big, there's just only so much you can get by develop, dividing through by r or r squared or r cubed. Um, so just two things to note here. I said irrelevance was the best case for the pessimist. Here, pessimism is making it harder to get a high value for reducing existential risk, right? If you've got linear growth, the value of existential risk reduction decreases linearly with risk. And if you've got quadratic growth, being a pessimist quadra quadratically reduces 
the value of risk reduction. So it really looks like pessimistic views about risk is what's making the drag on value happen here. And just to get a sense, I think, um, with some representative numbers about how that drag is happening. Let's look at the table here in the bottom. So I've graphed across the top levels of existential risk per century. 20% is where I ballpark the pessimist, and then 2%, and then 0.2%, and then 0.02%. And down the columns, I've graphed value growth modes, so no growth, and then linear growth, and quadratic growth. And you'll see you can certainly get an astronomical view if you drop your pessimism. So if you move to the bottom right, yes, the bottom right of this table, you've got, you know, 0.02% risk per year. That's optimistic, and you've got a lot of value growth. Now, all of a sudden, just reducing risk by 10% in your own century is worth more than 10 to the sixth times the value of the century. But the pessimist is stuck in the left. They're starting at a 20% level of existential risk, and you ask, even on linear or quadratic growth models, how valuable is a 10% reduction in risk? And you're definitely getting more value here, but we're not, I think, going to get into the stratosphere this way. All right, so what else could you try besides value growth? One thing you might do is, I've been talking about the value of reducing risk in your own century as though your actions affect your own century but have no effect on the centuries that come in front of you. I hope most people here think that is importantly not true. Um, so the question is, what if I waived this assumption and I assume that your actions now could affect meaningfully risk in 10 centuries or 50 centuries or 100 centuries? And the answer is that's going to help, but it's going to help by surprisingly little. So let's just be very generous and assume you can snap your fingers and reduce risk, again, relatively by some fraction f, not in one century, not in 100 centuries, but in every century to come by some fraction f. And I'm going to consider large fractions, 50%, 90%. Just assume you could affect risk in every century at once. That's certainly going to help the valuation for risk reduction, but the question is, how much is it going to help? And the answer is, again, not as much as you'd think. So if you push through, I've just got the simple model, but now we're looking at a different kind of risk reduction. What's the value here of reducing risk by some fraction f? You've got this V over R term you come to expect. So the more important V uh, century of existence is, the more important reducing risk is. The more pessimistic R you are about starting levels of risk, the less important reducing risk is. But now you've got this new, it's uh, F over 1 minus F term. Um, yeah, so um, scaling with the fraction F by which you reduce the risk. And this is cool because obviously if, it, if you reduce risk by something close to zero, this is going to tend to value towards zero. But finally, 100% reduction in risk per century is going to get infinite value here. And you can get arbitrarily high value if you put, put F high enough. So we at least have the possibility of astronomical value here. But it's something of a bare possibility given reasonable empirical assumptions. So by way of illustration, let's just look at the value of reducing risk um, by some level F across all centuries at once. Again, on the top, I've got levels of per century risk before you reduce them, 20%, 2%, and so on. And going down the sides, I've got, um, what did I put there, right, levels by which you could re reduce risk across all centuries at once, 10%, 50%, 90%. I'm not claiming this is empirically possible, but just imagine it were. And again, as you move towards the right, as you get increasingly less pessimistic about where we're starting, you can get quite high amounts of value here. And when you build in value growth and other things, this is going to be large. But if you're stuck in the red column, if you started with a 20% level of existential risk, then even 90% reduction across the board in every century would be worth about 45 times as much as the present century. So it's a high value. It's nothing to scoff at, certainly. But we're not yet getting astronomical values for reducing risk. OK, so if you wanted to go astronomically here, what would you do? Well, what people often do, you'd go for a time of perils view. So I think Toby Ord made this famous, and this was originally um, written by Carl Sagan. So the idea is, look, we're living in a perilous time now. Our technologies outstripped, as it were, our wisdom to manage technological risks. And that this time of perils is going to be characterized by uniquely high existential risk until we learn to manage um, the perils posed by technology. And then risk is going to fall to a very low level, and then it's going to stay there for a very long time. So as it were, you have pessimism now, but optimism later. And this is the move you should expect, right? You have to temper your pessimism somehow. This is the natural way to do it. 
Um, so how would you model the time of perils? I think the natural way is, well, look, right now, risk is at some perilously high level. I'll just call it R because I've already been using R for that level of risk. And that's going to last for a perilous period or a time of perils. Let's just call that capital N centuries, but you could call it, you know, whatever you want. And then afterwards, the innovation here is that after these N centuries, if we survive them, risk is going to fall to a much lower level RL for low, and it's going to stay there until the end of time. And so this model is going to work as before the first N centuries, you've got value V per century, V, 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 V. You get the first one with probability 1 minus R, the second one with probability 1 minus R squared, and so on and so forth. But the innovation is if you survive all of this, that's going to happen with probability 1 minus R or 2, you know, however many centuries you've got to make it through. Then you've got the same value mode, but a much lower level RL of risk. And if RL is low enough, this term on the right can be quite large and push the model high. So this is the only one that gets a little bit ugly. If you push through the value of reducing um, risk, again, now in your own century by some fraction v, it comes out to a sum of two terms. So the first term I didn't give you, it's less than the value of a present century. So if you're interested in the prospect of astronomical value, it's not going to affect much. What's driving, at least at the astronomical end, the value of risk reduction here is the product of three things. So um, let's just read it right to left, I think is helpful. Of course, first, the value of the safe world that you'll get to, so the value that the world would have if you had successfully ended the time of perils. The higher that is, the more important it is to reduce risk and help us get there. Second thing you need to multiply through by is, of course, the fraction f by which you reduce risk. If you reduce risk by 50%, that's five times as good as reducing it by um, 10%. And the first two terms are a little ugly. It's an R, one minus R to the something like that. Really all you need to know is high R's tend to drag this down and high N's are going to tend to drag this down quite a lot. Um, so two qualitative observations to make here. Um, this can be astronomically valuable, but if it's going to be astronomically valuable, we'd better hold two things. So first, we'd better hold the time of perils is going to be short, right? Because the value of reducing risk is decaying exponentially in the length of the time of perils. So if you think we're going to be in peril for 20 centuries or 30 centuries or 50 centuries, you're going to run out of value very quick. And second, you'd better say that the level of risk after the time of perils is low, right? Because the whole punchline of this model is you're going to shift to a lower level of risk, and that's why you're going to be getting more value. But if you're not shifting to, you know, three or four orders of magnitude lower in terms of risk, you're not going to have qualitatively much of a difference in behavior. But if you do have all of these claims, then you actually can get an astronomical value for risk mitigation out of the time perils hypothesis. So here, this is the only time I've changed up my tables. I'm looking at the value, again, of reducing risk in your own century by 10% um, in relative terms from where it started. Now across the top, I'm graphing the length n of the time of perils will be in danger for two centuries, or five, or 10, or 20. I think I went up to 50. <laughs> And down the bottom, I'm looking at the level of um, risk. I called it a post para risk you'll fall to afterwards. So you might imagine a 2,000% reduction. You go from 20 to 1% after um, the peril's over. You might imagine we go to 0.1%, or you might imagine we even go at the lowest column to 0.01% per century afterwards. And so as we saw, moving to the right, if you have a long time of perils, 20 or 30 or 50 centuries, you're just not going to get much value to reducing existential risk because it's very unlikely we'll survive the time of perils to accumulate that value. Moving up, even if you have a pretty low level of existential risk, like 1% or a tenth of a percent per century after the time of perils, it's going to be hard to get value. But moving towards the bottom left, if you have both, say, a two or a five century time of perils, followed by a very, very low level of risk thereafter, you can get very large value on this model. And again, plug in value growth or something, and the value is going to get larger. So summing up, what have we done? We've um, gone through half of the paper. So we looked at the relationship between two claims. The first was um, the astronomical value thesis, as it were, that not only is it valuable to reduce existential risk, but astronomically valuable. And the second was pessimism about existential risk, is the idea that existential risk per century is very high. 
And we said you might think that being pessimistic about risk makes it more or not less valuable to reduce it, especially when you're looking at relative risk reduction. But actually, well, claim one of the paper is it gets worse across models, not better for the astronomical value thesis, the more pessimistic you are. Second claim, we looked at ways to get both an astronomical value for X risk reduction and pessimism together. We looked at value growth. We looked at reducing risk across centuries. And we settled on the time of perils. We said this is probably a pretty good way to go. Um, third claim I want to, so right, so first the remaining question. So if all this is right, it looks like a very important claim to understanding the value of existential risk mitigation is um, the time of perils hypothesis, is it true that if we make it through the time we're living in now, the risks that we face as a species are going to drop very low and stay low for a long time? Provocative claim I'm not going to defend, but I do defend in the full paper, is that maybe we should not believe the time of perils hypothesis. And if that's true, either we'd want to be a little bit less pessimistic about existential risk, or we'd have to drop some of the high valuations we put on, astronomic, on existential risk mitigation. So um, there's the link to my paper and some of the other papers out of the Global Priorities Institute if you're interested. And let's stop here for questions. Great. Thanks very much, David. Um, the first question we've got. Um, so what are the practical implications of this paper? So people working in existential risk, what should they think after reading your paper and what might they do differently? Good, so one of two things. Either one, you're not so pessimistic about existential risk, in which case actually the upshot is not so bad for you. So if you started with a very low level of existential risk, you're still gonna have a pretty easy time getting an astronomical value to mitigating it. On the other hand, if you start with and have a pessimistic view here it actually might look like existential risk is less important as a cause area. So none of these models suggest that existential risk would not be as important as a cause area. You know, we're still talking about things on the order of magnitude of one or five or ten centuries of human existence. But the kinds of very high stratospheric estimates we would want to get in this cause area might be harder if you have a pessimistic view about where you're starting. Great. And another question is, so, a lot of the people in the audience are undergraduate, undergraduates or still in study. What would you recommend they do if they were interested in working on similar topics to yourself? Oh, interesting. So um, this gives me, I guess, an opportunity to plug. As many of you know, I work at the Global Priorities Institute. We do um, foundational academic research arising from the question, how to do the most good. What do you do as an undergrad? Um, take hard courses, do well in them, read a little bit of VA, but more broadly, just um, do well in your studies. What do you do when you're starting to think about master's and PhD programs? Well, one, apply to Oxford. We fund a scholarship every year, one in philosophy, one in economics. Um, and also, if you're interested, send an expression of interest to not only Global Priorities Institute, but a lot of related institutes. We have expression of interest forms. And every time you send one of those in, you know, people will read it and they'll um, get to know you a little bit better. And it's a nice way to get to know interested people in the community. When you say related institutes, um, so Forethought Foundation potentially, what others are you thinking Oh gosh, of? so it, it depends how broadly you would want to work. Uh, Forethought Foundation, Future Humanity Institute, Center for the Study of Existential Risk, the Berkeley Existential Risk Initiative, um, there are a couple of new institutes coming up this year. If you're interested, catch me or um, I see Sven over there. Um, catch anyone from GPI and we would be more than happy to talk to you about institutes in this space. Great, um, and we only have time for a final question. Uh, what caused you to be interested in this, in this quite niche line of work? Oh, interesting. Should I say this out loud in front of, yes. <laughs> I'm somewhat skeptical of the amount of effort we put into existential risk mitigation relative to other cause areas, and this is a very tentative foray into making a case for that. It's very tentative because I haven't done anything near enough to talk anyone out of that, but it's as it were like an initial exploration into whether I could make my view academically defensible. Okay, wonderful. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. There are a few extra questions, but I'm guessing they can potentially grab you afterwards for this. Okay, um, please join me in thanking David.